I have five players you need to watch in the HBCU Legacy Bowl slash Combine. And then also Tennessee State must remain hot going through the rest of the season. Oh yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU. Your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked on HBCU podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked on podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day day and remember just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over it just means it's time to follow me on twitter at south exclusives which you can find right here at the bottom of the screen but then also if you're on the audio side don't forget s on the end and today's episode is brought to you by linkedin with linkedin jobs you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills values and experience to help you achieve your 2023 goals post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lock on college terms and conditions do apply and i want to start off with the five players that i think we need to watch you have to have your eyes on these five players at the hbcu legacy bowl slash combine the combine is going to be today i'm recording this monday morning i think the combine is probably going on as we speak i'll cover that tomorrow the actual results of it but right now we're just going to have our eyes on who we need to watch not only today but then going out throughout the week and everything of that sort first player that i want to name is xavier smith and it's something about these FAMU players. I don't know what it is, but something about these FAMU players, their size is a big limiting factor for them. Not for them as far as how they produce on the field, because Lord knows Xavier Smith has produced on the field. It's nothing about that. I mean, he's been an all-conference player in both the MIAC and the SWAC. He's had over 1,000 yards and double-digit touchdowns, both of those metrics in two separate seasons. He's been a very productive player. If you com- compare him career-wise with... Other FCS players who are going to be coming out, he's going to rank pretty highly in a couple of statistics. He's done his part on the field, but he's still 5'10", 170. Some people even say he's 5'9". Now, does that bother me too much? No. Actually, his size bothers me less than Isaiah Land's size did. It doesn't bother me because he's dynamite. He's shown how explosive he is on the field. However... A lot of people will kind of neglect what they've seen on the field, not only because of his size, but then also because he did that at an FCS level. Now, we've seen smaller players. I've seen smaller players myself on my team do this, two of them back to back. And they're both undrafted free agents, but they can be successful wide receivers. However, people are going to ignore a lot of the things that are on the field. So what you have to do is in this combine. You have to come in and you have to explode. You have to show your explosiveness in actual numbers, in actual tangible numbers. You can't just be like, oh, that guy is blazing fast. No, I have to look at the numbers and say, oh, this is a blazing fast time. It sucks, but that is truly the burden. That is truly the requirement that comes when you have a size, I will say deficiency, and you have to prove people wrong. You have to prove people that this this size is not going to matter. That's what I see, and I, I like Xavier Smith, personally. I think that he's a really good player. I think he deserves some more love. I think he deserves some more recognition. Like, to me, I think he's one of the best, if not the best, uh, HBCU wide receiver coming out this year. That's how I feel about him. He has all the parts to me, but we'll talk about him at a later time, I'm sure. So let's move on to the next guy. And the next guy that we're going to talk about is Robert Mitchell. And he's been real quiet for the best offensive lineman on the best offensive line in HBCU football on the championship team it's been really quiet for that guy since the celebration bowl really it's been relatively quiet for North Carolina Central in general but he is a little bit more surprising because he's one of the bigger names he doesn't play a big name position I will admit that but he is one of the bigger players from that team and I don't just mean size wise inside as a guard this man is rarely allowing a pressure never allowing a sack dominant performance you know that you're good that's the one person you know what line whoever you want in front of Robert Mitchell 
He's going to take care of it. I'll just worry about the other four doing their job. But Robert Mitchell, he got it. Not worried about that at all. But it's been relatively quiet. I'm not so much looking towards the combine for him. It's more so of the legacy bowl. I just want to see him continue to do what he does. I don't think he's going to move from guard. I think he's going to stay right there at that position. So it's just about continuing the dominant streak. It's just about interviewing well. Things that I won't be able to see. I think those are the things that are going to do well for Robert Mitchell. Now, next lineman I want to talk about is, excuse me, the next lineman I want to talk about is Drake Sinners from Texas Southern. Now, the thing that I think is going to really get him some love is his versatility. He plays everywhere, right? Including, most importantly, left and right tackle. Because he played left and right tackle, you feel like, oh, I can put him on either side of the line, no matter if I want to slide him inside the guard. He has the experience with the footwork. People talk about the footwork switch between going from the left to going to the right. Well, Sinners already does that. So no matter if you want to slide him in the guard, you do know that's one less part of the process that you really have to try to coach him up on. And that's a benefit for him. I think he's even the uh, emergency center for the for the Tigers. So you look at a guy who has played all five positions or can play all five positions. That's one thing that's going to do wonders for him. And I'll be looking to see where they place him the most. If he only plays one position, I'll be seeing where they place him at all in the Legacy Bowl because that's both probably where he thinks he projects and then also where at least the coaches in this game project he will, he will play on the next level. So and that's something to watch. Now we're off of the big uglies. Oh, I lied. We're not off the big uglies. We're on to the defensive big ugly. We're talking about Joshua Pryor, who is a dominant defensive lineman. Had over 20 tackles for a loss in three different seasons in his career. His first three, he was absolutely dominant. He won the Defensive Player of the Year in the CIAA this past season. So he's been an impact player for pretty much his whole career. And a lot of people thought he might even have jumped ship after uh, Damon Wilson left Bowie State. But he didn't. He stayed and he ended up getting Defensive Player of the Year. But here's the thing is his size has kind of fluctuated throughout his career. And that's why a lot of people think he's a hybrid. If you go to the Bowie State website, they'll say that he's 280 pounds. You go talk to somebody else, they'll say he's 255. I'm okay with his weight fluctuating because he's done it on the inside and the outside. And because he's done it on both the inside and outside, now I feel like, you know what? I can, I see his frame allows him to play on the inside. I see his frame will allow him to play on the outside. Wherever I decide, I trust he can either put on weight or lose weight. We'll see what his weight's going to be now. I can't wait to see that metric. But I trust in him to be able to do what I need him to do to play the position I need him to play. And then lastly, we're going to look at Afonso Graham. And now we are done with the big uglies. We're back to the MEAC. And we're looking at the running back position. He is the self-proclaimed fastest running back in the MEAC. Now, he's going to need to be the fastest running back at the HBCU Combine. We're back to HBCU Combine numbers. Like I said, this is a Legacy Bowl slash Combine preview. For some of these players, the Legacy Bowl is what I'm looking at. For some of these players like Smith and Graham, I'm looking at the Combine. Because if you're going to be the fastest running back, you need to be that because you're only 5'9". He has the same size concerns that Xavier Smith has. Now, I don't want to make it seem like small players just can't play. We've seen that. However, I also know that small players are required to have a little bit more oomph, a little extra, just this extra quality that somebody of greater size is not required to have simply because they're fighting a losing battle. So they have to prove that they deserve a chance despite something. So if you're going to be the fastest running back, you got to be the fastest running back. And look, I know a lot of defenders are familiar with the back of Alfonso Graham's jersey. I know that. I've seen that. But I said the same thing when it came to Smith. You can't just pass the eye test when you don't pass the eye test vertically or, or, or size-wise. For both of them, it's vertically. You have to pass the number test. You just had a hot senior season. Came out after hitting 1,000 yards. That was really a breakout season for you after a, a season where you were bubbling up. But now you got to come out and you got to blaze the field. You got to show the speed that's going to make people say, oh, okay. Because there's a, there is a role for short, fast running backs, period. And Afonso Graham, if you can show that you're fast, you've already shown that you're short. I mean, it's no denying that. But if you can show that you are that fast, game-breaking fast, there's going to be a role for you. Now, I just named five players. Five players for you to watch. However, there's way more than five players out here. So I don't want to make it seem like there's these are the only five. 
look, man, if you if you feel like somebody's left off the list, drop it in the comments. Say it on Twitter. I don't mean any disrespect. There's more people I could have added to this list if I wanted to, but I wanted to keep it at five. So let's keep it at five. And speaking of five, Tennessee State's win streak has ended at five games. However, they were able to bounce back and win the next game, which brings their total to winning six of the last seven, where they're going to need to win probably their last two games if they really want to improve their OVC seeding. And we're going to talk about the game they have next against UT Martin as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before we get into that, today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. And listen, it's the only graphic that's in the top of the screen. That's kind of weird to me if you're on the audio side you probably don't care however we all know that people can create success maintaining success as an individual way harder nearly impossible you're going to need a team and there's no better place to build your team than linkedin if you need somebody for this role that role that role why sit around and just have people bring you information when you could go actually seek them out when you can actually go look for somebody who fits the mold of what you want somebody who you feel like is going to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Why would you do that? Why would you wait around when you can actually go be selective? It makes more, way more sense to me to go to LinkedIn and look at the over 800 million people who are on there. The 40 million who come on there every other week. That makes way more sense to me. So go ahead and go to LinkedIn. And if you're looking for a job, they're looking for you. It's two sides of the coin. People who are looking for jobs and people who are looking to give out jobs both of which are there, so both of which can benefit. It's just that simple. Go to linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. And as we continue rolling with today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen of the day, make sure you guys are checking out the Locked on College Basketball Podcast. You can get that wherever you get your podcast, and it's everything you need around the sport in one place so make sure you guys are checking that out and let's talk about a little bit of basketball we're going to continue with basketball as we wrap up the show tennessee state split a back-to-back and their streak or their stretch is not done and they need to make sure that their streak continues if they want to just improve their seeding in the ovc tournament now tennessee state took a five-game win streak into a really tough back-to-back game not back-to-back as far as thursday friday but back-to-back as far as just Tough game, tough game, back-to-back on the schedule. I think they they split it, and I think that's a pretty solid outcome. Unfortunately, they weren't able to beat Moorhead State, but they were able to beat SIUE. So let's let's look at Moorhead first, because Moorhead is the top team in the conference. They retain OVC supremacy, knocking off the blazing hot Tennessee State Tigers, right? And they just won this game inside. They just won this game by being better in the paint, right? So Tennessee State had 24 paint points. Moorhead had 22 in the first half. That, that's, that's, that's the difference. Tennessee State barely hit 24 in the game. Meanwhile, Moorhead has like 40, scores 22 in the first half. That's just what they did. They were able to stack up all the blocks. And, and you look at scoring, they had three players. I think over 15, so they didn't have the career high, but they had multiple players. And Dedrick Boyd, just he wasn't able to be enough with his 23 or 28 points. It just wasn't enough because you had three, four players who are scoring in double digits for Moorhead. But that's okay because that's the king of the OVC. But now you play SIUE. And when you play them, I guess there was a little bit of pent-up offensive frustration from both Junior Clay and then also just the Tennessee State team because... You drop 100 points. JR or Junior Clay drops 40. He's the first Tennessee State Tiger to hit 40 since 1989. This is a career high for him, obviously, because he wasn't the player who hit it in 1989. But he wasn't just a big-time scorer. He also added eight rebounds to the game. He also led the team in assists. He also contributed a steal of his own. Marcus Fitzgerald Jr. and Dedrick Boyd both hit double digits as well, scoring over 13 points apiece. This was a full team win. And honestly, this was not a complete flip, but a partial flip in a sense that they were the team that were dominant in the paint. They were the team that was very successful inside. That wasn't the case against Moorhead, but now it was the case against SIUE. And the stretch isn't over for Tennessee State. I focused on these two games, these last two games, because I knew we'd be back on Monday. And I knew I would talk about this stretch either Monday or Tuesday, whichever one was just better to discuss it on. But they got UT Martin on Thursday. 
And that's one you can't look past. So it was really like a three-game stretch of tough opponents, but I just made it into the two because I knew we'd talk about it before the third came up. Now, here's the thing. Is they were in a five-game mashup or five-team mashup in the seedings for second place. Five-game tie. Five-team tie, excuse me. So now in those teams... You had two teams that went 2-0, and two teams that went 1-1, one and one, and one team that went 0-2. So the way that it's shaken out is Tennessee State ends up at number four, tied for fourth. But they ain't done shaking. It's still, you know, you still got good games. You still have to play UT Martin, which is one of the teams that is ahead of you now because they went 2-0. and Well, you got to bring that 2-0 and to 2-1 and because if you want to get second place, you can't lose this game. You lose this game, the best you can hope for is number three. That's the best thing that you can hope for is number three. However, let's talk about how Tennessee State has fared. Tennessee State lost this game the last time they played UT Martin, right? That's tough. And another thing is Tennessee State isn't that good on the road. They only won three road games. They're way better at home. So those are two things that are working against them. But I think there's a couple of things that work for the Tigers. And let me tell you a couple of them. One, they play way better the second time they play a team they lost to. They just don't, they don't get swept off. Only Moorhead State was able to do that. And they're the best team in the conference. So is that really a knock? So let's look at it. When they're facing a team that they've played, or they were, when they're facing a team they lost to the first time, I should say, they're 3-1 and one against those teams. They've had four matchups of such. So 3-1, and one, their opponent point totals have dropped by an average of 12.5 a game. Their point totals have increased to uh, about eight points a game. And they usually win. They're 3-1. and one. All of those are better statistics when they play a team that they lost to the first time. So that's something that's way more impressive than their losses on the road or the fact that they lost to UT Martin the first time. That's thing. Those are things that will give you a little bit more optimism. So I wanted to go ahead and end with that. But we'll see what the game's going to be. But basically, you need to win this game. You need to win this game. If you want to have a chance at being second place and not being third place or worse, you need to win this game and probably win your next two games in order to ensure that you're the number two seed in the OVC tournament at the beginning of March. And speaking of tournaments, the CIAA tournament is starting this week, specifically tomorrow with the opening round. We're going to talk about the CIAA tournament, the top four seeds, and then also the games that I'm looking forward to in round number one as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before we get into that, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. And Built Bar is the number one protein bar in the market, bar none. The Swiss Army knife of protein bars. And I say that because they have so many uses, so many flavors, so many styles. The variety and the versatility of Built Bar is on display in so many facets. So let's talk about the kinds that they have. They have the Built Bar, the regular, the original. Then you also have the Built Puff which is marshmallow on the inside. You have the Built Granola, where, or the Built Crisp and the Built Granola. They've had so many different varieties where all of these are topped in chocolate. All of these are delicious flavors that sound fattening, but at the same time, they're good for you. They're high in protein. They're low in fat, low in sugar. You can eat them when you want to go to the gym. You can eat them just because you want a snack. You can eat them when you need an energy boost. They're good for all of that, and they're just good and tasty when you eat them. So why would you want all of these benefits? Why would you want the Swiss Army knife for protein bars in your kitchen? You can go to Swiss, uh, or excuse me, you can go to Swiss. You can go to Walmart. You can go to Sam's Club, or you can get 15% off and have a little bit of patience and go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15. That's LOCKED15 at built.com, and you'll get 15% off your offer. And as we wrap up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, the CIAA tournament has been set, the bracket is set, the seedings are set, and games start tomorrow. So let's go ahead and recap, or excuse me, preview the, the tournament as it is. So we previewed the top of the conference. Why wouldn't we? All eyes are on number one. Name a sport where all eyes aren't on number one. Name a sport where five through seven gets more coverage than one and two. Name that sport and let me know, and I'll try to change my coverage to fit that mold. But that's why we've been focused on the number one seed in the men's division for so much. But at the same time, that ain't the only thing that matters. Not only in the sense that anybody has a chance to win it, but because the top four seeds all get a bye. I just want to focus on who's going to be the champion. And that happened to be Virginia Union, who did take care of Virginia State and is the standalone regular season champions when it comes to the men's basketball side of the CIAA. But let's read the top four seeds in the women's and the men's. So for the women's, you have Fayetteville State, Lincoln, Winston-Salem, and Bowie State. Now for the men, you have Virginia Union, 
Fayetteville State, Virginia State, and Claflin. Now, obviously, you see Fayetteville State is the only two teams or the only school that has two teams on both sides who are uh, who have a bye. Now, remember when I said that Winston-Salem State's losing streak to Claflin and Fayetteville State was going to come and bite them in the butt? It cost them the opportunity at the number one seed. And that's true. They wouldn't have got it anyway because Union would have taken care of business. However, they would have been the number three seed at the worst. At the worst, they would have been three. Now, losing to Johnson C. Smith did not help their chances. But they would have won the CIAA South that they just would have beat Fayetteville. That's all they had to do. If they beat Fayetteville State, they win the CIAA South. You beat either one of those teams and you have a top four seed. It was just that simple. You missed your opportunity, though. Because had you won one of those games, you're not sitting here talking about playing tomorrow. You're talking about, okay, I'm going to see what goes on tomorrow. I'm going to rest tomorrow. I'm going to have an extra day break just to make sure I come back fully healthy. But instead, you're playing round one. You're the number five seed. That's, that's the difference. That was the, that's the consequence for losing the game that I was talking about. Um, one thing that I found interesting is that the top four seeds, and I know it's like this in most tournaments, but it's just interesting because the number one seed does not guarantee you the easiest path. But it does if there's no upsets like that. That's what it guarantees you. It guarantees you the the best best case scenario, I guess the way to say it, because the or, or the best predicted scenario, because nobody predicts an upset. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an upset. So if all the favorites win, the number one seed will be winning or will be playing the lowest seed remaining. However, because it's not like this in football, you all know, I'm a football head. But if they lose or there's an upset, instantly two through four faces a worse team. That's something I just found interesting. But um, what game am I looking forward to? Both of the games that I'm looking forward to have to do with Shaw. Shaw on the men's side against Bowie State because they split that season series. And it's the only game of all the first round teams where the lower seed has defeated the higher seed in the regular season. It's the only one. And they split that matchup. In the regular season. And Bowie State won the last time they played. Well how is Shaw going to bounce back? Now you look at Shaw versus Claflin on the women's side. And the big reason is that Claflin is the number three defense. And Shaw is the number four offense. That, that is something that I feel like is the making of a good game. Anytime you have two teams who are either high ranking on the same side. Or just high ranking period. Whether they're both good offensively. Both good defensively. And one good offense or defense. I like the offense versus defense because I feel like something has to break. But that's what you have here. Something has to break. One of these defenses, or excuse me, one of these side of the ball has to break. Whether that's the defense or the offense. So, and then the other thing is just very similar to the men's side. Where Shaw lost the game to a lower opponent or lower seeded opponent in Claflin. Same way they lost to a lower seeded opponent in Bowie State. So that's kind of just a repeat of that. I don't want to describe it again, but they did lose that game. They weren't the only ones who lost to a lower seed this side on this side, but they did lose it. And that's one of the things that intrigues me. So we'll be watching and, and talking about these games as they go on throughout the rest of the week. And especially as we get closer to the conference championship. And we'll also be talking about the Legacy Bowl as the week continues. Tomorrow, we'll be recapping the HBCU Combine and some of the standout numbers and performances from the first day of this kind of decorated week because it's the hbcu combine and the legacy bowl two separate events but combined into one week so we'll be talking about the combine on tomorrow's episode i appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day for your second listen make sure you're checking out locked on college basketball it's everything you need around the sport in one place wherever you get your podcast in the meantime in between time if you're looking for me you can find me on twitter at south exclusives until the next time that we hear each other family take care stay blessed peace